Hello Saints, welcome back to this platform. We're into the series for Proverbs chapter 3 and um, this, this is, uh, my name is Michelle and um, we're studying the word, we're learning how to dissect the word through um, this specific chapter and um, it has been titled Guidance for the Young according to the NKJV Study Bible by Holman and like I mentioned we're on to verse 13 and it reads Proverbs chapter 3 verse 13 Happy is the man who finds wisdom, and the man who gains understanding. Praise King Jesus. Okay, um, let's have an opening prayer first. Thank you. Father in heaven, we thank you. This is the day that you have met. We're so excited to be in your presence. Holy Spirit, we call upon your presence. And um, the scripture says that the angels of the Lord encamp around those that fear the Lord. So we're here as those that fear you, and we trust that through your word, the angels will be filled in this place because I know that in, you know, in your presence, there's fullness of joy. And this platform is pretty much Mount Zion because all we ever do is glorify your name. In scripture says that at Mount Zion, there shall be deliverance. And, you know, it's, it's a city where there's um, an innumerable company of angels. So as we listen to your word, let there be deliverance, let there be healing, let, let there be peace of mind and prosperity. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Okay, <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13. I'll dig straight into it. I want to thank everybody that's tuned into um, this series for Proverbs 3. And um, if you've been with us all the way from verse 1 to 13, I thank God for you. If you haven't, it would be nice if you start at the beginning. We've done verses 1, 2, 3, 12, all the way to 13, and we have been super blessed. So I suggest that, you know, you can start at the beginning as well so we can all learn how to dissect the word and get the word to speak to us directly because what we do is we get a verse and then we bullet it and then we pull out the operative words and from those words we try and look at um, the biblical meaning of each and every word that stands out and then that way we trust the Holy Spirit to minister to us. So I humbly request that you have your Bible with you if you're stationary. If you're not, have your spiritual antennas alert high so that, you know, the Spirit can minister to you as well. Because like I always say to you, I only give you a small fraction of what I've understood, but I trust that the Spirit ministers to you more. So your revelation coupled with mine is what helps us to amplify our understanding of what it is that God is saying to us. Praise King Jesus. Okay. <clears throat> Proverbs 3.13, it says, Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. I like that. Oh, <laughs> uh, um, we have to find wisdom, but then we gain understanding. That's what's standing out for now for me. When I look at the meaning of those two words, to find is um, it's kind of like a, what's it called? Ugh, to a treasure hunt to find wisdom. It takes an effort. Like we we have to get out of our comfort zone and get into a spot where we find a wisdom. Like um scripture, a scripture that comes to mind is in um is it in Psalms? It says that it's the glory of kings to hide, but it's the no, it is the glory of God to hide, but it's the glory of kings to seek and find. So a person that has to find wisdom. Um, the process of finding wisdom calls for a person to be a king, and to be a king is to stand in a place of authority. Also, scripture says to us in the book of Proverbs um, that, you know, a king's word is, you know, final, treasured. A king speaks on behalf of the Lord, because also, you know, to be a king is not something that just happens naturally, even though sometimes it may take um, voting by ordinary people. Kings are chosen of the Lord. If we look at... Um, Psalm 70 something, praise King Jesus, Psalms chapter, the book of Psalms chapter 75, I think, Psalm 70 something, is it 75, just bear with me, I'll know when I get there, my Bible speaks to me, I don't speak to it, yes it is Psalm 75, Psalm 75 says, for exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. But God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. So a king is, um, comes as a result of the exaltation of the Lord. It is the Lord that elevates people to be leaders. And like I mentioned a few seconds ago, that even if it takes a whole village to vote for a person, still 
the Lord is involved. Because again, Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1, <clears throat> says to us that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. So we know that everyone's heart is in the hand of the Lord. So it is the Lord that puts it on a person's heart to vote for a king. Because again, the king's heart is, is in the hand of the Lord also. So basically the heart of the king is the heart of the Lord because the Lord governs the king's hearts. But then also it is the Lord that chooses the people to vote for a person to become king. So um, it's the glory of God to, to hide and it's the glory of kings to seek and find. And so we're still in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs and I'm trying to describe um, the word find. I'm sorry, I've started in the middle. I like to just flow with the spirit. So happy is the man who finds wisdom. So to find, for one to be happy, they need to find wisdom. And to find is a task, right? Okay, you know what? Let's go slowly. Let's go slowly. Let's bullet this entire scripture. So the first line is, happy is a man. Happy is the man who finds wisdom. <coughs> Who finds wisdom? Okay, bullet number three. And the man who finds understanding. So, no, no, the man who gains understanding. Praise King Jesus. I feel like the Lord is going to really excite us today with this information, with the knowledge that we're about to receive. So the key word in all of this is wisdom. Two key words, wisdom and understanding. Wisdom is the biggest treasure that we'll ever have as human beings. Wisdom is what makes people um, qualify for whatever it is that they need in life. Um, kids wake up at as early as 5 a.m. to go to school to acquire wisdom, skills, so that they can be prosperous or, you know, so that they can qualify for whatever they need to be when they grow up, you know, worldly standards. Um, but then we, we want to address wisdom as, um, as it comes from above, heavenly wisdom. Because again, scripture says in the Bible that there's heavenly wisdom and there's demonic wisdom. There's the wisdom that we acquire when we go to school. There's the wisdom that we acquire from the world. And then there's the wisdom that that's, you know, we acquire from God. So the book of James, bear with me because now I want to um, break down what wisdom is. The book of James is in the New Testament. I believe it is before the book of First Peter, yes, it is. How does it describe wisdom? First Peter chapter 3, verse 13 says, or that it is titled Heaven, Heavenly versus Demonic Wisdom. Verse 13. Wise, no, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. I repeat. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Verse 14. But if you have bitter envy, self-seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but it is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Praise King Jesus. So we're talking about heavenly wisdom. Heavenly wisdom is the wisdom that we get from God. And heavenly wisdom has been equated to um, meekness. Yeah. Let who is wise and understanding among you, let him show by good conduct. So wisdom is showed by wisdom. We, we determine if a person is wise by their conduct, good conduct. Okay. And... Uh, Good conduct is a result of works done in meekness of wisdom, right? So there's good conduct, and good conduct is meekness. Meekness is um, basically um, a sister word to humility. May not necessarily have the same meaning, but, you know, they go hand in hand. When I think of a man that was meek in the Bible, I think of Moses. The Bible refers to Moses as a meek man. Moses was very humble. 
Moses, like he was, you know, he had, um, Moses was the chosen of the Lord. Moses was pretty much the first Jesus in the Old Testament. Uh, well, not, not the very, is he the very first one? I think Isaac is or Abraham is. Okay, Moses, Moses was anointed by the Lord to go and get the children of Israel out of Egypt. Um, but for all of that to happen, the anointing, for him to be anointed, the Lord had to humble him, you know, and, 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 and for, you know, Moses had to lose a lot of self, a lot of himself for the spirit of the Lord to be able to operate within him. When the Lord wishes to use us, he, that he gives us wisdom. But the journey to acquiring wisdom is the longest ever. It requires a lot of um, correction by the Lord. In the previous, um, I think it was um, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11, we talked about how the Lord purges us in order to humble us. And that's exactly what Moses went through. Because, you know, Moses, Moses as a baby um, was adopted um, by... Um, Pharaoh's daughter, and, and you know, and um, he grew up in the palace as a, a son of, you know, the queen, the, the king's daughter, sorry. So Moses had a very good life uh, until um, something happened. He had a fallout with, um, he tried to kill, um, um, he killed a person to start with, and then um, he found out that um, fellow Hebrews knew that he had killed somebody, and, you know, Pharaoh found out as well. So Moses had to run away into the wilderness and then he ended up at, um, you know, a man, a priest called Jethro at Jethro's home. And, you know, he married Jethro's daughter and he started to work for Jethro in the wilderness. It was a far cry from the life that Moses grew up in. Moses, first of all, he was in the palace, well taken care of. And then the next minute he knew he, he, he was in the wilderness and he was, you know, facing, you know, he faced a lot of hardship. But by the time the Lord calls him in, uh, I think it's Exodus chapter 3, with the, the burning bush incident, he was proper humble. He was proper humble. He had walked a journey, a journey of humility to the extent that every time the Lord spoke, he heard, you, you know, he recognized um, the, the, I'll open for you Exodus chapter 3. I don't, I don't want to go very fast because we're here to learn. And I don't want anyone saying, Michelle said, all I want us to ever say is, God said, or the Bible said, praise King Jesus. I am just a microphone of the Lord. And when I speak to you, I try to use the scriptures so that we can know that it is the Lord speaking and not I. The word of God is God himself, according to John chapter 1, verse 1, which says that in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. Also, the word of God is Jesus, according to John 1, 14, which says um, that, you know, the word became flesh and we beheld his glory. You know, the, in the beginning was the word. Now the word becomes flesh. The word comes here on earth as Jesus Christ. Also, Revelation chapter 19, um, verse 13 says, you know, I saw Christ on a white horse and he had a name written on him that nobody knew except himself. And that word is the word of God. So I want us to treat our Bibles with the utmost respect, knowing that every time we open this book, the Bible, Jesus or oh God is literally speaking to us. And we all know that Jesus is God because, you know, in the beginning it was God, then God came down in flesh as Jesus Christ, praise King Jesus. So Exodus chapter 3 verse 1 says, <clears throat> Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of the Lord. Verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Now, this is the scripture I'm looking for, verse 2. I was saying to you, Moses was humbled so much, yeah, by the situation that he went through um, in the palace to the extent that he had to run away. But the Bible says that um, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, that the angel of the Lord, when you read the New Testament and you see the angel of the Lord, you will see that angel is capital A, and, and angel with capital A is uh, pretty much Jesus before Jesus comes in in flesh. You know, Jesus as a spirit. Praise the Lord. So anyway, 
the angel of the Lord, capital A. So we're looking at, you know, also I said to you earlier, when we have capital letters, we know we're either addressing God or Jesus in the Bible. Everyone else is small letters. I really feel so bad and frustrated when people spell God with a small g. Small g is uh, small gods, yeah? God is capital G. Jesus is capital J. When we're writing him or he or referring to him which, in whichever way, it's always a capital letter so that we can accord him the respect that he deserves as the creator of the universe, aka the savior of the whole world, praise King Jesus. So this uh, verse 3 is saying the angel, capital A, of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush. He's, the, the Bible says, so Moses looked and behold, the, burn, the bush was burning with fire. So two things I want us to, to point out here. Number one, Moses looked. Number two, he beheld. A lot of us look, but we don't behold. And that's why we come to these scriptures. Some of us read the Bible, we just look. We look in passing like we're reading any other book. But we need to take a step further and behold as well. When you look at the book of Revelation, when um, John the Revelator, the former, you know, John was a bestie who walked closely with Jesus, one of the disciples. So, you know, he's taken off to the island of Patmos. He's consecrated so that, you know, the Lord can appear and, and speak to him. Remember, I'd say to you, it's the glory of God to hide, but it's the glory of kings to seek and find. So God is hidden. Not everybody can find him. For Moses to find the Lord, he had to um, go through tough, tough situations. Like, you know, he ended up at, you know, in the wilderness he ended up out of the palace where he was brought up john the revelator despite being a best friends with jesus you know the beloved of the lord the bible refers to john as the one who rested in the chest of, of jesus he also was taken off imprisoned at the island of patmos you know revelation chapter 1 verse 9 i think it talks about him being at the island of patmos where jesus appears to him so humility or meekness happens as a result of consecration praise king jesus revelation chapter 1 verse 9 says i john both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of jesus christ was on the island that is called patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So meekness is what enables us to hear the word of God. Normally when we're so busy going about our lives and we have everything figured out, it's very difficult to hear the voice of the Lord. But when a situation appears that makes you lose all of yourself, that you know makes you um, lose life as you knew it it pushes you into a corner where your spiritual antennas are open to hear from god because it leaves you no option but to hear from god also i need to stress this we don't seek the lord yeah um it is the lord that enables us to find him you know god is god above every situation you will find that moses didn't outrightly go out um, to kill another person so that the lord can send him out of the palace he did it out of compassion moses um he um he loved he was a hebrew boy that grew up in egypt with um the egyptians but then he saw his brethren um fighting and and he felt compassion and he stood up to help he stood up for his brother you know like why are you hebrews fighting and then they said to him yo who, who died and made you king over us we had a rumor that you killed a hebrew guy the other day do you also want to kill us so a situation happened but it was the gentle hand of the lord consecrating moses pushing him into the wilderness so that he can empty him of self because a lot of us our issue is self we are so proud we're so self-consumed we think that we have it all figured out we think that we know it all and the lord has to pass us into some situations in order to humble us and also we can see that john was taken to the island of Patmos, not by choice. And also, I like Jesus. Jesus is so exemplary. Everything that we have to go through as human beings, he came here to show us as an example because we can also see Jesus himself when he came here down on earth before he starts ministry, he's also shipped off to the wilderness to humble him, you know, before the spirit of the Lord can, you know, start to, before he can start to minister. Listen to this. Matthew chapter 4 verse 1 says, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Verse 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Praise King Jesus. But what I was interested in was verse 1. It says, Then Jesus was led 
by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Humility or meekness is bathed in the wilderness. And it is in the wilderness when, where we encounter wisdom. You know, you see, we're trying to talk about wisdom here because now we, we, we're trying to dissect Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13, which says, happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. Praise King Jesus. So um, wilderness is, a, is inevitable. If you ever see a person that has a lot of godly wisdom, it's because they've been through the wilderness. Mm -hmm. A wilderness is a place where God empties us of self, of ourselves, and then he fills us up with himself. When this happens, we become meek or humble, praise King Jesus. Very, very humble to the extent that our life becomes God's life. Anyone who touches us touches the apple of God's eye. I remember after this, you know, I, I like the story of Moses over here, and I like that we're using Moses because after him humbling and himself, or the Lord humbling him, the Lord presented a situation to him that really, really humbled him to the extent that he could look and behold, like to be very observant, to always come back to the secret place and go beyond just looking at the scriptures, but we dig deeper. Um, um, I think I'm looking for, I want to talk about um, the book of Numbers to, to explain to us uh, how this this gentleman was humbled to the extent that God would defend him. Moses became such a sweetheart of God, courtesy of um, the purging that he had been through, and he was so meek. Listen to, um, <clears throat> I'll read for you Numbers chapter 12. It says, shall we start at verse 1? Yeah. I want to explain the meekness of Moses after the experience that he went through of, of, of being humbled. Um, listen, Numbers chapter 12 verse 1 says, Then Miriam and Aaron spoke again against Moses because of the Egyptian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Egyptian woman. Please note that Aaron, that Aaron and Miriam are Moses' siblings, okay? Verse 2, So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through you, Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord had it. Now the man Moses was very humble, and the man Moses was very humble more than all men who were in the face of the earth. Praise King Jesus. Verse 14. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. Verse 5. Then the Lord came down in the pillar of a cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam and they both went forward. Then he said, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I the Lord make myself known to him in a vision or I speak to him in a dream. Verse 7. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all of my house. I speak with him face to face even plainly, but not in dark sayings, as he sees the form of the Lord. Why then have you? Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Praise King Jesus. I'm talking about wisdom. Wisdom is basically, the other definition I'm getting for, for wisdom is, wisdom is being able to speak on behalf of the Lord. Being able to speak on behalf of God. Okay? Now, to you know, as human beings, from our upbringing, from the system of the world, the schools that we went to, or the things that were said to us by other people, we can get so full of ourselves. For example, we have favorite kids in a family where daddy is always glorifying you and everything, every word that you speak, everybody claps their hands. But the thing is that the words that you speak are outside of the word of God. What we need to understand is before you were formed in your mother's womb, before you became the favorite child in your home or the favorite child in your school, God had an agenda for you. Like before you were formed in your mother's womb, he knew you, he consecrated you and set you aside, apart to be something, to be holy unto him. The Lord is holy and us who serve him, we must be holy. So when the Lord now wishes to use us, he has to fork out all of the understanding that we've got from our families, from our, um, our schools, from TV, from the company that we have kept. Now, all of this is a lot of work. It is super, super painful. This purging process is not, it, it's not, um, it's not baby food. 
And I like to say to you guys that if you love this platform so much, if you love this YouTube channel, it's not, it means that you're not an ice cream Christian. You're not a church goer. You are a person that the Lord has chosen to be used of him. So to be used of the Lord is to remove all of yourself, all of your understanding, everything that you ever acquired, courtesy of the countries you've traveled to or life as you knew it. The Lord has to remove all of that so he can put his words. When he puts his words in us, that's when we become prophets. A prophet is a person that speaks on behalf of the Lord. And I've explained to you the purging process that Moses went through after he, you know, he was, he, he committed, um, you know, he was just out of the palace and he had to go live um, in Midian with Jethro and, and Jethro's daughter, who, you know, his wife, um, Jechobed. So, Moses is, is, is the treasured of the Lord. So Moses' siblings, Aaron and Miriam, look at him as a brother. And so should they, because physically he's their brother. And, and you see, Miriam is Moses' big sister, so we can't you know, really blame her so much for being carnal, because we see Mir Miriam play a big role when Moses is put on the river Nile in a basket by his mom so that pharaoh doesn't kill him as a baby it is miriam that took care of um of, of of um moses on the nile it is actually miriam that tells pharaoh's daughter that look when pharaoh's daughter picks up miriam from the nile it is sorry when pharaoh's daughter picks up moses from river now it is miriam that tells pharaoh's daughter that look i i know this ba i know somebody that can take care of this baby so miriam has always been pivotal in taking care of um, moses but now moses has been through a purging process one he's consecrated from his father's house he's taken into the palace even though the lord extends grace and let that's his uh, biological mom breastfeed him while in the palace despite the fact that the mom had thrown him away, not thrown him away, put him away on, on the river Nile in a basket. Moses is not very close to Miriam when growing up. Moses has to, has to be taken out of his father's house, you know. And then when he grows up in the palace, up, uh, up to a certain age, he has to be pulled out of the palace to be taken to Midian, where he learns the ways of the Israelites, because Moses, the calling upon his, his life was to come back and rescue the children of Israel out of Egypt. So we see Moses growing up with a lot of wisdom of Egypt. But the Lord has to humble him to remove all of the Egyptian knowledge out of him and give him godly knowledge. But it, it also starts with him having the knowledge of how the Israelites operate because he's coming to save the Israelites out of the hand of the Egyptians. You know, because, you know, in uh, when we look at the book of Exodus, the people of Israel are suffering so much under the hand of Pharaoh in the early, you know, chapters of, of Exodus. So the Lord calls Moses to, to use him to deliver them out of the hands of their enemy, the Egyptians. But for Moses to be used of the Lord, Moses has to be humbled. Moses has to be super, super humble. For Moses to stand before Pharaoh and speak to Pharaoh on behalf of God, Moses has to be humbled. I'm talking about, the Bible says, happy is a man who finds wisdom. So for Moses to find wisdom, first he has to be meek, he has to be humble to the extent that, you know, when, when Moses goes to the palace, Exodus chapter 7 verse 1 says, So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. Now for the Lord to make you God, <laughs> to make you as God, it takes a lot of, you have to be very humble. You have to be very meek. But us as human beings, we don't have the ability to make ourselves humble or meek because by our Adamic nature, we're so puffed up. We have a lot of earthly knowledge that we think is the wisdom that's enough for us to survive in this world. And yet the Lord has put a lot of heavenly wisdom in his word. So heavenly wisdom is basically us being humble enough and stripping ourselves of all of the knowledge that we have acquired since we were babies in order for the Lord to speak through us, in order for the Lord to put his word in us. Now that's what qualifies us for humility. That's why in the book of Numbers, when Moses' siblings rise up against him and they start, they start to speak all manner of um, words against Moses, the Lord says that, you know, you guys, how, how dare you, how dare you, you know, the, the Bible says um, in, in verse 4 of 12 that suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron and Miriam, come out, all three of you, come out. 
to the tabernacle of meeting like let's go to the boardroom i need to have a word with you you know and then the lord said how dare you hmm? the lord said hear now my words is there a prophet among you i the lord make myself known to them in a vision i speak to them in a dream not so with my servant moses he is faithful in all of my house so faithful is the operative word for us to find wisdom we have to be faithful so faithfulness is key for one to acquire meekness or humility for one to be able to stand to speak before the lord for one to ingest the word faithfulness is key what is to be faithful to be faithful is to be diligent to be diligent is to show up every day whether or not you feel good about something you show up anyway we see a boy um show us a good example of um faithfulness the boy daniel in the book of daniel it is in chapter six i think give us a second we'll get there Daniel was the beloved of the Lord. Each time the angel of the Lord appeared to Daniel in the Bible, he referred to him, O Daniel, beloved of the Lord. But for Daniel to become a beloved of the Lord, he was faithful. Um, look at Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. It says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his window open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom. I like the word his. Daniel gave thanks to his God. Daniel referred to, you know, he's referred to as Daniel's God because Daniel was faithful. Daniel went to, um, to seek the Lord three times every day. It was his custom, whether or not he was on, in trouble. On this day, he was in trouble because a, a, something, a writing was signed against him by his co-workers because they were jealous of him. And, you know, he went as was his custom. So a faithful person is a person that goes to seek the Lord, whether or not, you know, the, the day is good or oh, bad praise king jesus so th th that's the kind of person that acquires wisdom daniel was so wise that he was able to give wisdom to the kings of the times in babylon for three regimes we see him give advice to you know king nebuchadnezzar we see him interpret dreams nebuchadnezzar's son what belshazzar and on to the next regime because he had the wisdom of the lord happy is a man who finds wisdom to find wisdom the wisdom of the lord we don't buy it we don't pay for it we don't go to school for it we find it by being diligent by being faithful in the presence of the lord even when we look at the boy jesus he had to be faithful in the presence of the lord like i just read for you in matthew chapter 4. jesus begins his earthly ministry at the age of 30 but before that he has to usher to be ushered into the wilderness to be purged to be tempted by the devil like i read for you in um, verse one of matthew 4 because before that um he was just a carpenter's son who grew up with his dad and you know with his siblings and his mom mary in the little um village of nazareth of um galilee so to remove the the, the galilean out of him to remove you know jesus is showing us an example that for the lord to remove my Ugandanness or my Michelleness or whatever school I went to or wherever I grew up, the Lord has to pass to pass me through a process of emptying me of myself. And the emptying of self happens at the feet of Christ. It happens when we seek the Lord diligently. So I'm speaking to a person that is the chosen of the Lord. And there's a scripture in the book of Revelation. Um, you know, the angel sounds a trumpet and is speaking and is saying, you know, the 144,000 that make it to Mount Zion, that make it to a place where they can worship the Lord, the ones that survive um, Babylon, the ones that survive the trials of this world. Number one, they are the called of the Lord. Number two, they are the chosen of the Lord, but also they are the faithful. Some people are called of the Lord or chosen of the Lord, but you know, until you are faithful, you can't speak on behalf of God. Moses was called, so he was born with compassion. That's why when he saw um, two fellow Hebrews fighting against each other, he came in in his own power in self to solve the problem. And instead it got him into trouble that he was chucked out of the palace and into the wilderness to look after cows for a living to work for his father-in-law, which is so juicy. But all of this was the Lord you know, pushing Moses into a space of faithfulness to the extent that when he sees a burning bush, he doesn't just take it at eye level, like I explained to you earlier in Exodus 3. He looked and he beheld. 
So the Lord is trying to grow us women from a level of just looking at things at surface level, but we behold. To behold is to take things to another level. You know, your sight, it's to, to behold takes um, the eyes of your understanding be, being enlightened, like we see in Ephesians chapter 1, um, verse 17. To behold is, um, what is it? It takes the Lord. It's a gift that's given us, to, that it's a gift that is given unto us, but in a space of humility when we have nothing left but to look at Jesus for answers. You know, like for example, we see um, the boy John, John the baptizer, use it in the book of John. When he sees um, in John chapter 1, when um, John the baptizer sees Jesus walking um, toward um, the river Jordan, he uses those words like, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I'll read that for you because now we're looking at the word behold specifically. John chapter 1 verse 29, it says, The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now for John the Baptist to get to a level where he can behold and recognize the Lamb, there had been a purging process that pushes him into a space of humility. John the baptizer had spent a lot of years in the wilderness in order for him to learn to hear from God. Please note, John was a pastor's kid. John was born of um, Zacharias and Mary, and the Bible refers to them as um, faithful servants of the Lord. When you look at the book of chapter, look, chapter 1, it shows us that, you know, John was born by parents that spent a lot of time in church, but that didn't qualify him for a servant of God because all of us have our individual calling and your individual calling involves you having to speak on behalf of the Lord. But for you to be able to speak on behalf of the Lord, you have to have a personal, a personal encounter with God. In this kingdom of Jesus, there's nothing like inheritance, like, oh, I'll be a pastor because my dad is a pastor. Oh, I will inherit the church because my dad. No. Everybody has an individual journey. Look at Luke chapter 1, um, verse 5. It says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Praise King Jesus. So John the, uh, John the Baptist's dad, Zacharias, he was serving, burning incense at the altar, serving the Lord. And he was from um, the lineage, um, the, the, the priesthood lineage, you know, the Levitical priest, uh, the, the Levitical priest as chosen by the Lord in the earlier days. In, um, you know, after the children of Israel um, leave. Yeah, after they leave Egypt, praise King Jesus. So despite having God-fearing parents born in the right godly family, this man, John the baptizer, for him to be humbled in order for him to be able to behold, had to walk his personal journey. Because the minute John the Baptist is born, the Bible says... Um, the John of the uh, sorry the birth of John the Baptist it says that he was taken away in a in um uh -huh. John chapter 1 verse 80 it says so the child John grew and became strong in spirit and was in the desert till the day of his manifest manifestation to Israel so this is the the whole of um chapter 1 a lot of it if you read it for yourself, it talks about how um, John the Baptist comes into play. His parents are believing God for a child for a long time. Before he comes in, an angel of the Lord comes and gives the mother the itinerary of who, sorry, the father, Zechariah, the itinerary of who John shall be. And then John is finally born and, you know, but there comes a time when this boy has to be sent away to the desert until the day of his manifestation, until the day that he is presented to Israel to speak on behalf of God, to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. So this is what faithfulness does. Faithfulness opens up the eyes of our understanding. But you see, unfortunately, um, faithfulness doesn't come on a silver plate. I, can, I speak from experience. <laughs> the Lord has taken me through a lot. For him to enable me to say one or two words on his behalf and um 
it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good when you go through a good number of unpleasant situations. But what I can say to you is the little glory, the glory that happens, the glory that manifests upon your life after the purging process, after the Lord sharpening your ears, is is um is beautiful. It's beautiful. I remember one time I was at church in 2021 and my pastor gave a prophecy and it's, you know he called me Michelle from the back of the church and he said, you know, in you there's bellies filled with living waters. I pray that the Lord opens up your eyes so that you may see. <laughs> now, I was so excited. You know, all of us, when the pastor is moving around, we like for him to lay hands on us and say A, B, C, D. But boy, the word that is said about you a prophecy that is given to you is the beginning of sticks and stones in your life until that which has been said comes to pass. You know, it is said about Moses in the book of Psalms that the word of God purged, sorry, Joseph, the word of God purged Joseph until the word of God that was spoken to him, until the promise on his life came to pass. The word of God tested him. So this is what happens. You know, you, you go through unpleasant situations. And unfortunately, some of us like to start blaming, uh, you know, there's a, you know, so-and-so has done this to me. Everybody doesn't like me. So-and-so did this to me. We even blame the witches. Yeah, there may be witches, but the Lord knows everything. I like the book of um, Psalm 139. If you read verses from 1 to 12, it explains to you clearly that the Lord knows when we get up. The Lord knows when we lie down. The Lord comprehends our path before we even get there. He knows what we're going to say. You know, behold, he knows what's on our tongue before we even say it. The Lord knew us when we were carefully, you know, wrought in our mother's wombs. He knew before we even entered our mother's wombs. The Lord knows everything about us. So I feel like we need to get away from the space of the self-pity and blaming whoever's responsible for the misery in our lives and take this humble pill and try to take that path into faithfulness to a spot where, you know, the Lord can speak to us to teach us what he needs to, to teach us so that we can become prophets, so that we can speak before him. As I was describing faithfulness and a scripture came to me from Isaiah and I'm, tr I'm trying to pull out, um, the Lord is saying to you that's listening to me that look, as the chosen of the Lord, faithfulness requires you going to the secret place every day. So my question to you is, when do you visit your secret place? When, when do you go to that spot where the Lord speaks to you every day? And it has to happen every day because the, the word of God is new every morning. Life's challenges are new every morning. So we need to be diligent. It is the grace of the Lord that helps us. But we need to listen, we need to go so we can hear from him so that we do not drown in life's uh, you know, sorrows or so that we do not make the entire process very, very long. You don't want a journey that could have taken four days to take a whopping 40 years like our cousins from, you know, the, the ones that were in Egypt in, in bondage. I'm looking for a scripture. Mm -hmm. Isaiah chapter 50 says, listen, Isaiah chapter 50 says, Verse 4 says, The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned, that I should, I should know how to speak a word in season to, whom who, to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. Praise King Jesus. So, much as it's the Lord that draws us unto himself, the Lord chose Moses, the Lord chose Joseph, the Lord sent Jesus, the Lord chose you, the Lord chose me. There's a part for us to play. The Lord will wake you up. But the question is, will you throw your duvet away and wash your face and go before his face so that he can speak to you? And his face being the word of God, praise King Jesus. For example, I was woken up this morning at 2.30 a.m. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to go back to bed until now. But, you know, we have an arrangement. Before I used to set my alarm for 3 a.m. or 3.30 or 40. But you know, now even if I don't set it, he wakes me up still. Like, wake up, wake up. If you are going to speak on behalf of me, I need to fill you with my words, praise King Jesus. So, you know, this scripture is saying, the Lord, for him to make you a prophet, for him to give you a tongue of the learned, 
for him to enable you to speak a word and it is established, you literally have to lose all of yourself. You need to, to lose all the beliefs. You need to lose, you know, whatever life meant before. And life has to be, what is God saying? What does the Lord has, have to say to me? You know, I like verse 5. It says, the Lord has opened my ear and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. So he opens your ear so you can listen from him. Because again, a lot of us go to the Lord with our ideas. We want to tell him what we want. We even seed for what we want. We serve for what we want. And he's saying, humble yourself. In order for you to speak on my behalf, in order for you to be like Moses, you need to be humble. You need to be meek. And that takes coming to me every day because I need your vocabulary to change. I feel the need to um, um, share Job chapter 22 because also that one picks it out nicely. For you that is chosen of the Lord. Where's the book of Job? It's before Proverbs. There it is. It's before Psalms. Job chapter 22. You know, a lot of us like this scripture that says, oh, you will decree a thing and it will be established. Uh-uh. We, we, we shall not be one-liner people. You, what are the verses before that? What is the instruction that the Lord is giving to you before you qualify for a person that speaks the thing and it, it shall be established? So let's go all the way back to verse 21 of Job 22. It says, Now acquaint yourself with him and be at peace. Thereby good will come to you. Receive, please, instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart. Do you see that over there? Like be faithful. Always come back to the secret place um, so that you know you can get acquainted. An acquaintance is a person that walks closely with another. If I for, well, this journey of Christ has purged me good and proper. If I have any acquaintances, they're not more than the, people, the, the, the fingers on this hand. Maybe one or two or three people are my acquaintances, my close, close people. And then, you know, the, the hi, Michelle, does, that, that's, well, tons, tons, like four bendy buses or four double-decker buses, tons and tons of people, right? But, and, and, and this is what the Lord is saying, acquaint yourself with me, like walk closely with me, be my disciple. A disciple is a person that walks closely with their leader, like the 12 disciples walk closely with Jesus. To be discipled is to be disciplined into the person that you're following. Because again, the word discipline comes from disciple. All of those words, they have a similarity in there. So there's got to be a discipline where you walk so closely with the person that you think are like, and you have to walk so closely with them so that you get to this part in um, you know, Job 28 where it says, For you will decree a thing and it shall, be, it shall be established for you, so light will shine on your ways. Praise King Jesus. It says that, you, you know what? Don't get tired of seeking the Lord. Seek the Lord. Do life the right way and I'll make you prosperous in a way that you have never known. You don't have to sweat like the rest of the world to make money. Listen to um, Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 26 it says for god gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good in his sight but to the sinner he gives the work of gathering and collecting that he may give to him who is good before god praise king jesus so listen do you want to be happy because that's the first word in our scripture happy is the man do you want to be happy Come and seek the Lord diligently. Come to the scriptures. Find out who he, who he is. Every time you open this Bible, open it up, not just as a novel, but with the intention of finding out the nature and character of God. Like what is the nature of God? Who is God according to the scriptures? Because God is so big. He's so vast. He doesn't have one name. Um, he says to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 3, when Moses says to the Lord that, okay, you're sending me to Egypt. Who shall I say sent me? What shall I tell the children of Israel? Then the Lord says to Moses that you see those kids over there. Previously, I revealed myself to them as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But now you go to them and say to them that I am that I am. Tell them I am has sent me. What is I am? I am is you. I'm a covenant keeping God. I am multiple. I'll be what you need me to be in your life situation. If you're not feeling well, I'll reveal myself to you as God the healer. But for you to understand it and believe it as a result of it settling in your heart, you have to faithfully, diligently come back to me in your secret place like Daniel 
If Daniel is doing it three times a day, you can choose to do it one time a day. But I assure you, that diligence is what gives you an antidote to life's stress. There's so much stress in the world. People, everybody is operating on a mental illness. What's it called? Spectrum. <laughs> Lately, I've noticed mad people is not necessarily guys that are walking around without clothes or eating from a dustbin or whatever. Even guys in suits are struggling. Madness is basically the inability for one to manage their mind. That's why a lot of, you know, rehab centers are filled up to full capacity. There's no room or some are having to see private, you know, people. Those that are not into God are going to see shrinks or seers or, you know, healers or whatever fancy name you give it. But if you don't come to the Lord, you're going to fellow human beings. How can you trust a fellow human being to give you advice about yourself? By the way, before you go to this shrink or to this healer, look at them. When you look at them closely, are they richer than you are? Are they more prosperous than you are? Do they look peaceful at all? It's, it's just me when I see them in the movies, they look, they don't look as, you know, prosperous. I mean, if they had it all figured out to the extent of advising you to tell you what's going to happen in future, why does their life look so mediocre? Because they use um, what's familiar spirits. Familiar spirits tell them things to tell you and these familiar spirits are actually demonic and you are unknowingly being entered into, you know, evil covenants, demonic covenants with the devil's kingdom. The only source of wisdom, the only source of the truth is in the Bible. The words that the Lord says to us are spirit and are truth. The words that Jesus says is the absolute truth. And the absolute truth starts with you accepting that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. The news of the gospel. The gospel is the truth. So the first information that you need for you to tap into this kingdom of wisdom is accepting that, you know what? God loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. The entire journey that Jesus walked on earth and he gave us a demonstration of how life is done, every step that he took was to the cross. So when you believe in the cross, then you will actually have access to the power of the cross. The power of the cross is what gives us a revelation. The power of the cross is what enables the spirit of the living God to be upon us so that we can also carry our crosses to a place of freedom. Let me tell you, this pilgrim journey is very, very long. There's a book. If you have kids and you're watching this, you need to look for a book called um, The Pilgrim Journey. It's a very good book, but you know, it's for kids. I borrowed it from a friend of mine that's not older than 18, but um, when I read it, it's, it's it helped me a lot and I think it's even much, much nicer if you have a knowledge of the Bible because it's a summary of um, the life of a, a Christian. You know, the, 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 the temptations that we face, the trials that we face, but, and then finally we make it, you know, it's a very good book. And, you know, ironically, not ironically, but factual because it's the truth, um, the guy that wrote it, he also wrote it when he was in jail. So I thank God that the author was taken to jail so he can sit down and write down all of these things. Jail or wilderness is not a bad thing for us Christians. Jail or wilderness is the platform that the Lord uses to reveal new things to us. I told you about John the Revelator in as early as um, Revelation chapter 1 verse 9. He, John is being ushered onto the island of, of Patmos. And imagine all the way to um, chapters 20, all the way in the 20s, the Lord is, is still speaking to him. To John and when John is speaking he'll say to you oh, and then I, I you know I, I opened my eyes I saw and I beheld you know this most of um I think starting at is it 8 or 18 you know he hears a sound before he can actually hear the angel of the Lord you know he can hear a trumpet sound or he hears the sound of the waters moving before he hear, his ears are opened to hear exactly what the Lord is saying and then he has all these things documented so that you and I can believe you know, it is so interesting that a lot of what is written in the book of Revelation is already coming to pass in this present age that the scripture says. When the book of Revelation says that the, the river Euphrates will dry up, it's already dried up. Google it if you like. 
when the book of um, Revelation says to us that Babylon has fallen, we can already see many signs of how Babylon has already fallen. The people that we thought were super rich, that they were superstars, and you know they've made it because they're in wealthy countries and they look like they have all this money, and we look up to them on our screens, and our children aspire to be like them because they're good actors or musicians or whatever. Next thing you turn your TV on, they have fallen. They have fallen, like Babylon has fallen. Why? Because what it's only God that does things that last forever. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 14. It says, I know that whatever God does, it shall not it shall be forever. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. So if we're not in God and we're amassing all of these riches, just know that these riches will go like nothing. No wonder this wisest man, um, Solomon, tells us that, look, guys, all of this is vanity. Waking up to work, life is overrated. All these things shall perish. Because it's come to an understanding that life is actually about people. Life is treating others well. Life is about a legacy. Life is about the greatest command, which is love the Lord God with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your soul. And also love your neighbors as you love yourself. So whatever it is that we're doing, am I saying it's bad to, to you know, to, to, to strive to, 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 to be financially well? No, I'm not. I'm just asking you to balance the both. Jesus loves prosperity. Mind you, the main reason I fell in love with Jesus Christ when I first read the book of Matthew from the first verse to the very last verse of the last chapter was Jesus had wealthy friends. For me, that was the main attraction. I like a good life. Jesus, when Jesus died, you know, he had a good friend who had a house with a penthouse and you know before he dies the last supper was held in a very beautiful mansion on the rooftop that's where all the 12 sat and broke bread for the last supper and then i also read that you know when he died when he has a rich friend joseph of arimathea who went and picked up his body and wrapped it in a very very nice clean linen and then jesus was buried in a hewn rock a rock that was so brand new that hadn't been used for anything else then we also have rich friends like Nicodemus that financed the gospel. Then we also have, again, I think it's Nicodemus that offers the, you know, the, the fragrance, the expensive oils that were used to, 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 to when these ladies went to check on Jesus' body in the grave. So Jesus loves us to be rich, but the kind of riches that we want are only enjoyable if they're tied to the kingdom. That's why scripture says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will fall in line. Righteousness being doing what is right, and you know, the ultimate righteousness is believing God, because again, scripture says in Genesis that Abraham was counted righteous because he believed God. There's nobody that believes God and God sits in them and is able to sin, because that's all the way here in the in the letters of again john the revelator the beloved of the lord the books of first and second john that to have jesus inside of you is what stops you from sinning again the book of jude i think also says to us, says to us in jude 1 24 that unto him jesus who is able to keep us from stumbling and you know he keeps us presents us faultless before the throne and full of joy so happy or joyful is a man who finds wisdom who finds jesus and the man who gains understanding. Now, what is understanding? Understanding is to depart from evil. The Bible talks a lot about an understanding heart. The people that we see in the Bible that have an understanding heart are the people that were able to depart from evil. A lot of us, you know, you know. so for example, right now in the book of Proverbs, we're talking about King Solomon who had um, wisdom. But we also see that the prayer that King Solomon prayed, he didn't ask God for wisdom. Nope. King Solomon asked the Lord for an understanding heart. Praise the Lord. Yeah. First Kings chapter 3 verse 6 says, Now Solomon said, You have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You have committed this great kindness for him, and you have given me, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne, and as it is this day. Now, O oh Lord my God, 
You have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. Your servant is in the midst of your people, whom you have chosen, a great nation, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. Now, to, to be understanding is to be able to discern good from evil. That right there is the meaning of understanding. To look at a situation and you say, mm -mm, that I shall not do because it is not right in the sight of God. Of God. Now this I will do because God agrees with it. That is what understanding is. Let me break it down for you. When your parents were bringing you up and you did something that was stupid in their sight, they would say, you kid, why don't you understand? What were they saying? I need you to have a mind like mine. I need you to imagine like I do. So every time you do things in a way that the people of that have authority over you don't understand, don't do these things, they will say that you lack understanding. But here is what it is, sweetheart. The only understanding that you should have is the understanding of the Lord. The Bible says that let all men be liars, but let God be true. Hallelujah. So for God to be true, for you to know that you are in truth is when you walk according to the scriptures. Then the scriptures show us what is right or wrong, and then we shall know what not to do. Another person that had an understanding heart is Abigail in the book of First Samuel. When the Bible is describing, describing Abigail, it says Abigail was a woman of good appearance and an understanding heart. When you read that chapter much further down, we see Abigail exhibiting understanding that when her husband, who lacked knowledge of the word, was acting as a fool in the sight of David, Abigail goes and says to, her, to, the, to, to, to David that, look, my husband is a scoundrel. Like, you know, he is, his name is Nabal and his name means foolishness. Like everything that he does it's out, is outside of the word. But look, I, I understand what the Lord says. So please don't be upset with our entire family courtesy of my foolish husband. Please, this is what we should do. The Lord has anointed you king over Israel. If you kill my husband, you'll be a, you know, guilty of bloodshed and then you'll never make it to the throne. But better still, what you know, I mean, the Bible says, do not avenge yourself. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. Why do you want to avenge yourself with this foolish husband of mine? So she exhibits an understanding heart when she enables um, King David to depart from evil because David had determined to come and kill all the men in Nabal's house because Nabal had disrespected David. So David looks at this woman speak and everything that comes out of um, Abigail's mouth is courtesy of the word of God. He looks and says, oh, bam, blessed are you because the Lord has sent you to me. Why? Because Abigail was speaking in authority as an angel. So we see that book, when we read the book of um, the story of Abigail in the book of uh, uh, Samuel, we see a woman who is faithful in the sight of the Lord that she doesn't have her words anymore. Everything she speaks is according to the word of God and it just doesn't stop, stop at speaking her actions as well. Because when she goes to meet up with David, she knows that I'm going to meet a king. So I need to appease the king. And to appease the king, I need to go with gifts. Why? Because when baby Jesus, the king of Israel, was born, the three wise men took gifts. Offering gifts or giving is an act of worship. So I'll take, I'll send some gifts before me to appease the king's heart. And when I get to the king, I will bow down like a humble woman. And then I'll address the king with the word of God, because my actions have gone before me, praise King Jesus. The Bible says that a person's gift opens doors for them. The actions that Abigail exhibits open the door for the words that she's going to speak to be received by David. Man, later on when Nabal dies, because foolish people end up dying, David sends his servants and says, please guys, go and bring me that chick. That's the woman I need by my side. I need a woman that has an understanding heart because I am a king. And if I'm going to govern, I need to be on a pillow with a woman that speaks wisdom into my ears as opposed to her whinging husband. So that's where the Lord is calling us to be as women, to have an understanding heart. This scripture has said to us, a happy man, maybe we should say a happy woman. Happy is the woman who finds wisdom. A woman who finds Jesus, a woman who finds the word of God, even though the journey to finding is the Lord. That's why it's called finding, you know, hide and seek. And the woman who gains understanding, understanding is gained. 
Understanding is not by lifting up holy hands or slaying demons. Understanding is by coming to the scriptures to read so you can acquire the spirit of discernment. I am going to close with Job chapter 28, verse 28, that also has that description. Praise King Jesus. Job chapter 28, 28. These are words that are spoken by Job. No, God is speaking to um, to Job because Job had a lot of drama because of whatever he went through. And, and the Lord is saying to Job, listen, um, Job 28, 28. And to man, God said, behold, the fear of the Lord. Now that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Guys, there's no other definition for wisdom and understanding. Praise King Jesus. It takes an effort. It takes faithfulness. That, that is what births a humble person. And for us women to reign, to live in authority as the women, as the creatures that the Lord created as helpers of destiny to powerful men, we need to operate in humility. We need to operate in wisdom and understanding. Because much as the Lord has anointed us as helpers, we're actually helpers to people that are bigger than us. A woman was derived out of man. The, the word woman means of man. Man was created first, he was put to sleep, and a rib was taken out of man to create us women. So because of the hierarchy that has been presented before us, there's God, there's man, there's woman, the only way that we can reign on the third row where we have been placed is by wisdom, to know when to speak and when not to speak. And when we speak, we speak the word of God, and we do it in humility. So the Lord is calling you that's listening to this, to faithfully walk. The journey of being humbled but like i said before you can't do it in your own might it starts with jesus the lord spoke in the beginning we did not listen the lord sent all manner of prophets to israel israel did not listen the lord sent until he had to still come down himself as jesus christ to give us a demonstration of what it is to be humble he came in jesus the humble son of God. Everything Jesus ever did was the way that God wanted him to do it. When you look at the book of John, when he's being fought by the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious leaders who thought that they knew it all because they were stuck in the law of Moses, he kept saying to them, I only do what my father tells me, tells me to do. You know, you know, verily, verily, I say to you, you know, I you know, he kept saying to them, Look, I'm not acting on my own accord. I'm walking according to the will of my father. At some point, they said to him, okay, show us a witness, Jesus, show us a witness. Jesus said, yo, my only witness is the one who sent me. So I'm speaking to a person who's facing all manner of persecution from people that think that they know it all, run to the scriptures. Your only witness is the one that sent you. And for him to be your witness, you have to speak his language, and his language is the word of God. I'm talking to a woman that's going to be surrounded by angels. Again, scripture says that angels hearken unto the voice of the Lord. So you need to come here to hearken unto the voice of the Lord so that angels can be ministering spirits unto you, the woman that wants to inherit salvation, both the salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ and for you to be a savior in your family, in your community, in the entire nation. I'm talking to a woman that wants to impact. I'm talking to a generational woman. A woman that needs to leave a legacy. We need Jesus Christ. So if, you, if you've listened to this teaching and it has blessed you, I need you to put your hand on your heart and repeat these words after me. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I believe that you came down from heaven, here on earth, you died on the cross, and you rose again. You were resurrected, by the power of God. I believe that with my heart and I accept salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for the words that you have given us. Father, I present every voice. I present every lady that's under the sound of my voice. I pray that you visit them right now, King of Glory. Let your salvation power visit every woman right now. I see a woman that's been battling depression, anxiety, eating disorders, all manner of mental disorders. Father, send your spirit right now. Please receive the spirit of the living God right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Spirit of the living God, you're very powerful. This person has been on medication for the longest, but you're coming in right now as the healing power that they need. 
Father, visit every woman under the sound of this voice that's been suffering depression because they didn't know where to turn. Thank you, King of Glory, because you're healing them right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I also pray that you send your spirit to open up the eyes of their understanding so that when they read the scriptures, they might understand and perceive so that their hearts may turn and you heal them in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I pray for every woman, every woman under the sound of my voice to receive right now the anointing to be good wives, to be good leaders, to be good mothers, to be good heads of community, courtesy of your word. Father, thank you because the spirit of Abigail is hovering right now. Every woman is receiving an understanding heart in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you because every woman that's listened to this message is standing in her position and raising her kids up in the way of the Lord. In Jesus' mighty name I have prayed. Amen. Thank you, guys. Um, we are at Crest Homes. This is Crest Homes in Kitende. It's a beautiful place. It's a home away from home if you want you know, to have a holiday, um, whether you're in the country or outside of the country. Please um, call the number to make your booking. It's only $50 a night. These are two-bedroom apartments. They're fully furnished. They're very comfortable in a quiet, serene environment. We have free Wi-Fi, free cable TV, and very good housekeeping. It's only um, five minutes drive from the main road, 20 minutes drive from the airport, 10 minutes drive to Kajansi Airstrip, seven minutes drive to Kajansi Market, surrounded by supermarkets and, you know, KFC and all the restaurants and everything that you need. It's also only half an hour away from Kampala CBD, so it's convenient if you want a good place to stay in Uganda. And like I said, only $50 a night. Inbox me personally or call that number for your bookings. And these apartments, there's six of them. It's a six apartment complex if you're traveling as a huge group. Thank you so much. God bless you and see you in um, Proverbs chapter 314. Bye.